Well, it's an honor to be here. Um, I'm humbled by holding the position that's previously uh, been taken by Raphael Mashulam. I hope that you were all there last night to appreciate uh, the testimonial. So um, I have an interesting task. I hope you'll bear with me for the next 30 minutes um, as I critique the cannabis industry and offer some not so humble remedies. So here we have Miss America 1980. Um, benefiting from virtual plastic surgery, but faded pulchritude does not equate to competence in a new industry, which is very complex. Would you buy cannabidiol from this man? This guy stole my suit. You can tell me, you can tell me later who wore it better. We're in the unfortunate situation of uh, not having our pronouncements taken with any uh, credulity by the people who make the decisions. And this is always going to be the problem when politicians are tasked with uh, trying to make sense of complex scientific principles. And so we're always going to be behind the curve as decisions are being made. We have a situation now of an industry that's trying to make do um, despite these obstacles of politicians, continued opposition from law enforcement. Um, the legal industry can be pro or con. You need to seek out the ones that are going to be a help rather than a hindrance. Uh, the states who have legalized are grabbing more than their share, and that for example, has strangled the industry in California, as we'll see. And we have a situation now where the FDA had the opportunity to say something useful about cannabidiol and others, and it totally uh, passed the proverbial buck. Meanwhile, the people who have spent decades learning how to grow this plant medicinally have suffered. And we have the situation now in Mendocino County where nine out of 10 farmers are unlicensed, um, and many of the ones who are licensed have gone out of business. So this has led to an exodus from the industry. Uh, I can tell you that personally, it took us seven tries to get a bank that would take our uh, business account. Um, we have a cash-only economy that puts spud tenders and other people at risk of, uh, of robbery or murder. Um, we also have a lot of unscrupulous people in the industry that don't pay their bills. Um, and this just leads to endless ripoffs and inability to get insurance. Uh, again, prohibitive tax structure and a situation where there are no margins in this industry so that very few people are actually making money. Um, and then there are the promises uh, that people make. In general, timelines are, are rarely met, um, and uh, people need cash on the barrel head rather than stock options, which rarely come to pass. Also, there's a problem with diversity in the industry. So here we have the rare black farmer. And there's still this. The commodity of which we speak is still federally illegal, irrespective of uh, state laws. So that's as much railing as I'm going to do. How about solutions? Well, this is a scene we'd like to see more of, acres and acres, as far as the eye can see, of a beautiful crop, an, an aromatic one. But a lot of the acreage has been taken up with cannabidiol. Now, nobody will say more than me that this is a remarkable and versatile compound, but it has severe limitations. As an isolate, very high dosages are needed. Um, it does not work as well on its own, and um, with the high cost, access becomes a very difficult problem for patients. 
and we have a situation now that uh, CBD has been commoditized. No one can come into the market and be preeminent or even successful. Uh, it doesn't matter how talented you were in another industry. Also, we've had the situation where the farm bill has been co-opted so that a lot of the CBD, which has been a glut on the market, has been turned into Delta-8 um, and other synthetic cannabinoids that have no place in, in human health application and can be outright dangerous. And again, I fault the politicians for not having the foresight to understand this and do something about it proactively. I think that the future really lies in diversi diversification uh, to different cannabinoids, and these can all be attained with conventional breeding. I am going to take the position that we don't need biosynthetics. Um, there are uh, chemovars of cannabis that are available through standard breeding that provide very cheap sources for these uh, different phytochemicals that can be commoditized as well. So really, people need to do something different. And as I like to say, sometimes you need to zag instead of zig. So here, uh, from a paper from a few years ago I did uh, with Jehan Marku, these are uh, 12 of the phytocannabinoids about which we know some degree of their pharmacology. But that ignores at least 138 other ones. Um, but every phytocannabinoid that's been discovered so far has some unique therapeutic properties. So we really uh, have not yet fully assessed the potential of this plant. So we're going to talk about a couple of possibilities. Uh, the first is tetrahydrocannabivarin, or THCV. Um, this was discovered uh, by my friend uh, Roger Pertwee in 1970. Now, how charmed a position was this? This was his first publication, and it was in Nature. Um, as old as I am, I've never had a publication in Nature. Uh, at that time, they, were th they thought there were six pharmacologically active components of cannabis. Um, they discovered this one, THCV, which has a three-carbon propyl side chain instead of the pentyl five-carbon side chain. Um, this was from a tincture of cannabis that had been grown in Pakistan. Um, they uh, showed that it was active in mice, but less potent than THC. But that was more than 50 years ago. We've learned some things since. But basically, this was on the shelf with no attention for more than 30 years. So uh, this is the normal pathway, uh, geranol pyrophosphate combining with olivatolic acid to produce the, the five carbon side chain uh, cannabinoids. Alternatively, THCV is made by this pathway. So geranol pyrophosphate, which is the parent compound to the cannabinoids as well as the terpenoids in cannabis, combines with diverinic acid to produce can cannabigerolic acid and onward uh, to the others. Um, just to summarize the activity, um, again, this was discovered in Pakistani cannabis. Um, in the first paper, um, they noted that CB1 was an antagonist at, uh, I'm sorry, um, that THCV is an antagonist at the CB1 receptor at low doses. But a couple of years later, they figured out that it was an agonist at high doses. So this is a nice demonstration of the biphasic dose response curves of many of the cannabinoids, different effects at different doses. And that can be leveraged in, in various ways, or it can be a problem with side effects. Um, in various animal work, uh, it was shown that this produces weight loss, decreased body fat, uh, and serum leptin concentrations with increased energy expenditure in mice that are genetically prone to obesity. It was also shown to have anticonvulsant properties, as do many components of cannabis. Um, it also treated neuropathic pain, decreasing swelling, and, and over, uh, overly sensitive uh, responses to pain. 
Um, our friend uh, John McPartland in 2015 showed that this lacks the side effect profile of the prior drugs that were used in this fashion, the inverse agonist, Rimonabant, which was briefly on the European market, never made it to the US market because of disastrous side effects. It actually lowers endocannabinoid tone. So yeah, people lost weight, but they were depressed, they were anxious, they had the lower seizure threshold, and a couple developed MS who hadn't had it before. Now, despite this not being freely available, there are THCV cultivars um, as long ago as uh, 15 years ago, THCV predominant plants have been developed. Uh, again, this hasn't had the attention by breeders that it deserves. Let's compare this to cannabidiol. So these both can attenuate THC sequelae, uh, reducing side effect profile. But again, THCV is what's known as a neutral antagonist of the CB1 receptor, whereas CBD is a negative allosteric modulator. It, it lodges on a different component of the receptor and makes it a little harder for THC to bind. They both affect TRIP channels, particularly uh, TRIP V1, um, but THCV is much more potent, which medically only means that you need fewer milligrams as compared to CBD for it to be active. Both of these phytocannabinoids can be used to treat pain, inflammation, and epilepsy, and both have shown, been shown in the animal work and anecdotally in humans uh, to help treat addiction to other substances. Uh, it remains the case that it, it's very hard to remove THC entirely from uh, cannabidiol plants because the CBDA synthase makes THC in a small amount. With THCV, it may be possible to get it to the point that it's considered hemp under the Farm Bill rules. Um, THCV should be a useful and adjunct to THC chemovars because it can complement the therapeutic properties and uh, reduce side effects, thereby increasing the therapeutic index of THC. In other words, the difference between the dose that's effective in treating symptoms and that which produces side effects. What do I see as the future here? Well, THCV has a variety of properties that make it potentially very useful in treating type 2 diabetes, obesity, the metabolic syndrome, things that are an affliction of the affluence of Western culture. Also treating addiction, and uh, there was one report indicating the likelihood of, of benefit in Parkinson's disease. So all of these areas require better, safer products. Because it is such a safe compound and so versatile, um, I think it's something that we should be adding to cannabis-based preparations. Um, this doohickey, if you want to put your camera on it, will give you access um, to this page in more detail and less blurry. Um, this is a cultivar called Pink Boost Goddess, available through Breeders Best. I'm the medical director of that company um, as a disclaimer. Uh, and if you can see carefully, this is about a one-to-one -one, uh, with good titers of both THC and THCV. Um, people who have used this, this cultivar um, like it very much and find it uh, very easy to handle and, and beneficial for a variety of conditions. The next one we're going to talk about that I think is the next big thing uh, is cannabigerol or CBG. Uh, what I like to call the mother of all cannabinoids. Now, uh, people are well aware that Professor Mishulam in the middle uh, discovered the, the true structure and synthesized THC in 1964. But with his um, research partner, uh, Yechil Gaoni, both pictured here in 2010, one of my proudest moments, um, in 1964, they also discovered CBG, and I, I want you to understand how prescient they were. Um, so they extracted this from Lebanese hashish that had been seized. 
on, they put it through this process and figured out the following, quote, cannabigerol represents the primary product and a missing link in the formation of cannabis constituents. Conversion into cannabidiol, tetrahydrocannabinol, and cannabinol is biogenetically plausible. Exactly right. Cannabinol, of course, is an oxidative breakdown product of THC, but uh, to me this is amazing with the technology that was available essentially 60 years ago. Um, this is from a study that uh, we published uh, a couple of years ago, and it was actually the first study in humans of the effects of CBG therapeutic that was published. Um, so we had 127 patients who we asked that they only participate if they had used material that was at least 50% CBG. Um, and again, the biosynthetic pathway of cannabigerol, uh, basically from cannabigerolic acid under heat or light, producing decarboxylation, you get cannabigerol. That's a photo of a, a CBG-only chemovar. Now, it may surprise you to know that uh, this was available like 15 years ago. Uh, why are we not seeing it in commerce universally? In our survey, we saw this long list of some 30 conditions that people had that they used CBG to treat. Um, ha over half the people were using it medicinally. Only 6.3% thought uh, we're just using it recreationally, but, uh, you know, the vast majority, we're using it to treat something. As you might expect, the most common conditions were anxiety, pain, depression, and insomnia, which is basically the profile of, of many cannabis-using patients. Now, the thing that surprised us was the degree of efficacy. And if we look at the big ones, you see p-values of 0 0.001 um, for many of these conditions, depression, anxiety, and uh, pain. What that means for people who aren't familiar, it means there's only one chance in a 1,000 that the results were due to chance. That's pretty convincing. And again, these are only self-reports. It's not a double-blind, randomized controlled trial. However, this is real. And for the other conditions, we see that the vast majority were improved, were much improved or very much improved. Um, although there were only a few patients with each, we saw big signals for endometriosis with two-thirds, noting very high efficacy, also for inflammatory bowel diseases and irritable bowel syndrome. And no one thought that conventional medicine in these instances was better than the CBG preparation that they were taking. Now, some people reported side effects, but there were ones that were obviously attributable to THC in people that were using a mixed preparation. And, you know, there were dry mouth, red eyes, uh, sedation. These were not seen among the people who were using CBG-only products. So our conclusions were, um, first of all, this is becoming more popular, particularly in the Pacific Northwest where I live. Um, again, this is the first study in humans. Anxiety, pain, depression, and insomnia were the most common symptoms, and efficacy was very high with very, very few reported side effects. Um, it was interesting, the uh, reports of benefit in inflammatory bowel disease are supported by animal work, um, and apparently this seems to be mediated through both the CB1 and the PPAR gamma receptor, which is a nuclear receptor that affects gene transcription. Um, we felt that this provided a good foundation for the safety of CBG for future randomized controlled trials. So no one at the FDA can say, well, nobody's ever taken it, so um, you need 10 years of development to show that it's safe. Um, comparing CBG to CBD, again, both may be uh, used to treat pain, anxiety, and aid sleep. CBD on its own does not treat sleep. 
uh, except perhaps at extreme doses. At lower doses, it's actually stimulating. Again, both affect trip channels, both have antibiotic properties, and both are cytotoxic for cancer cells without being uh, destructive of normal cells. Um, and both inhibit uh, fatty acid amidohydrolase, uh, the enzyme uh, that breaks down anandamide, so they may increase uh, cannabinoid, endocannabinoid tone. Again, cannabigerol is much more potent than CBD. If we're talking about isolates, 10 milligrams of CBG is an effective dose for anxiety, whereas it might take 200 milligrams or more of CBD as an isolate. And there are CBG-only cannabis chemovars that are available, as, as we'll see. Um, issues of CBG and THC. At this point, I feel that cannabigerol is a useful adjunct to almost all THC chemovars, uh, again, because of synergy and providing benefit on pain, sleep, mood, et cetera, um, particularly the anti-anxiety effects may really notably increase the therapeutic index of THC. Economic prospects. Well, I like to say that what the world needs now, particularly in the pandemic era, is a safe, non-sedating, non-addictive agent for anxiety, and CBG seems to be it. Um, because it's so safe and versatile, I think it should be a most uh, combinations uh, formulations, and that this is the way we're doing our formulation. Uh, I think that it's an impressive, impressive agent for treatment of primary cancer, uh, especially the prostate, um, uh, because it affects uh, TRYP-M8 receptor, which is a, a key marker in uh, prostate cancer. Also, CBG has very prominent antibiotic effects particularly against uh, gram-positives, but there are ways now to make it affect gram-negatives, but it, it really shines in treatment of methicillin-resistant Staph aureus and vancomycin-resistant, I'm sorry, yeah, vancomycin-resistant enterococcus. Uh, again, disclaimer, um, I'm the chief medical officer for Andira Pharmaceuticals, which is working in both of these areas. Here is a CBG-only uh, chemovar called Anomaly, again, available if you uh, scan the doohickey. Um, and if you can see the fine print, you'll see that basically all of the cannabinoid content is, is CBG. Again, there was no genetic modification here. This is just good Mendelian breeding. Um, right. Um, Another problem in the industry is extraction, and there were a lot of questions in the session I was in yesterday about uh, how do we best extract to save the key ingredients. Uh, well, uh, with my colleague uh, Jeremy Plum, who's in the audience somewhere, um, we did this study a couple of years ago, a process that, that we call cryokeef, uh, which was just trademarked. Um, so the, the idea behind this was, whether really necessary or not, it's become traditional for all cannabis for uh, use has been dried and cured. Well, it's been known for ages that when you do that, you may lose as much as 50% of the monoterpenoid content. If you believe in the entourage effect, as I do, uh, following the dictates of Professor Meshulam, uh, then you need that stuff, and it shouldn't be squandered um, if you're not going to be smoking or vaporizing the material. So uh, the process that we went through uh, that we call cryokeef involved um, exposing freshly cut cannabis immediately through a whole cold chain um, and exposing it to dry ice vapor uh, for up to 48 hours. Um, the idea being of fixing 
the trichomes, making them brittle so that they'll fall off properly. Also decreasing some of the water content. Then uh, we went through a sifting process uh, using this uh, pollinator machine, a very simple device. Um, you know, I think that this can be done um, much, in a much more sophisticated fashion. We wanted the biggest trichomes, which are 150 microns in size. Um, and uh, these are collected as keef, the Moroccan name uh, for hashish. Um, uh, if you wanted to call it something else, you could call it an enriched trichrome preparation, a uh, term coined by David Potter. Um, I'm just going to provide one example. We did six different chemovars, and chemovars will vary in how tightly they hold on to their trichomes. So this may be a process that's better for uh, material that, say, uh, might have had Afghan genetics, where uh, in the, that culture, uh, it's a traditional to um, sift cannabis to produce hashish. Now, if you look carefully at the uh, bars and the table, you'll see that we started off with a cannabinoid total of 11.5%, which was almost all THCA. And that was vastly increased by this process uh, to 58.5% percent of the total weight. Um, now, the, we, in other chemovars, we were able to show, again, concentration of, of CBD or even CBG through this process. Um, we did comparisons with material that was dried uh, previously and subjected to the same process, um, and uh, the yields uh, were, were not as great at all. With the terpenoids, uh, we went from a terp total of 1.38, a little bit low, uh, but that doubled to 2.87. And you'll see with each of the component that components that uh, the the, um, the gray, the cryokeef uh, was was higher um, than for all the other processes. And um, this. Article is available free online if you go to ethanrusso.org at the library tab. Um, you can see the full details of this. Now, more importantly, a graphic presentation. On the left, we have the cryo -keef. On the right, the more traditional approach to dried keef. And I think you'll agree that these look considerably different. Um, in the dried keef, there's a lot of particulate matter from the plant that is not something you necessarily want in your lungs and certainly isn't necessary to the medicinal effects. Ultimately, we got a yield that would be comparable to the, what's done with water hash, uh, but without all the water. Um, and uh, again, we were using relatively crude techniques as a proof of concept, and I think that this can be uh, yet refined. So, uh, what we were able to show um, was that cryokeef isolated the trichomes and highly concentrated both the cannabinoids and terpenoid components. Um, we think that this would be a very uh, good product on two levels. One would be for the cannabis connoisseur um, that instead of um, uh, an isolate with uh, uh, butane or some other solvent would be clean. Um, it would also offer the ability to have very good quality acid cannabinoids, um, which, if wanted, uh, could be secondarily decarboxylated, but particularly with preservation of the full complement of monoterpenoids. And this could be subject to secondary processing of various types. Um, Interestingly, the material that's left after the cryokeef process still had plenty of, of activity itself, and that could be solvent extracted or, or CO2 extracted. So really, uh, this is producing a value-added product, um, and yet um, not leaving waste that just needs to be composted, for example. 
Um, again, this offers the ability to combine acid and uh, neutral cannabinoids for whatever kind of therapeutic purposes. Now, I want to talk a little bit, uh, again, uh, disclaimer, uh, this material comes from uh, Breeders Best, headed by Dale Hunt. Um, I am the uh, medical director of that company. Um, this is what uh, he has called the new cannabinoid uh, discovery program. The idea being to gain the ability to isolate novel cannabinoids for future generations uh, to carry on after I'm gone. Uh, this is a technique that uses receptors to uh, identify the, the compounds. And without exaggeration, this is a million times more sensitive than standard techniques um, and instrumentation. So whereas the latter um, gets things down to the nanomolar level, this is the femtomolar level, or 10 to the minus 15th. The idea being uh, to gain the ability to identify rare cannabinoids um, that may bind to cannabinoid and other receptors, um, because not all phytocannabinoids work through that mechanism. Um, and the idea would be to screen breeder submissions uh, for this. Um, this is uh, an animation I'm just going to go through quickly. Uh, if you look at the economics, uh, THC uh, is expected to earn $73.6 billion by 2027, um, with CBD uh, $9.7 billion by 2025. There are about 10 others uh, that have increasing demand, as we've discussed, and then over 100 of others that we have yet to explore. Um, a lot of these are near or below detection limits with standard instrumentation. Uh, they may come from rare genetics. Um, the mindset has been really occupied with just CBD and 2-THC to the exclusion of others. Uh, with Breeders Best, the idea is to, uh, to license and um, provide intellectual property protection for unique chemovars on help them get developed. Um, and this is a way to, to, again, to screen for the future of, of commerce. So it all starts with the cannabis plant. Um, after a research license, uh, various tissues from the plant, not just flowers, um, there's potential for the roots and other parts of the plant. Uh, so this can be sampled and assayed Maybe we find a, a novel cannabinoid, and then it's possible to selectively breed to increase its concentration, um, producing progeny, which can be subsequently studied and go through the process again until you get it to the point where it's economically viable. So purification, studying its effects, and eventually getting it to humans for new products and medicine. Uh, and even producing uh, new industries, and hopefully producing a better quality of life for uh, patients and their families, and uh, with commercial opportunities. And I wanted to close with some discussion of formulation. It is very important to know for anybody who's interested in pharmaceutical development of cannabinoids that there are certain rules, and that is to produce a botanical, it all has to be from one species. So it is not a place where you could, could combine phytocannabinoids from two different biosynthetic sources and put them together without going through programs identifying the toxicity and therapeutic effects of each. And that, that's not uh, a good path uh, towards approval. So it's also true in New York State um, that any of the cannabis products need to be cannabis-derived. So that would mean that you wouldn't be combining 
uh, cannabinoids with linalool from lavender, for example. Um, so the path ahead uh, for true botanicals is by using all these components from cannabis itself. But it doesn't need to be from the same plant. I would point out that Sativex is actually a combination of two different chemovars, one rich in THC, one rich in cannabidiol. And these are combined, and that's been accepted as a unitary formulation by regulators in 30 different countries. Um, so really, I think one of the best paths ahead is creative combinations of phytocannabinoids and terpenoids and flavonoids, as we'll hear more about later, uh, that can be optimized for any particular clinical indication. And this is exactly the approach that we're using at Credo Science in our formulation now. So selective Mendelian breeding without genetic modification um, and the new cannabinoid discovery program would be the suppliers of the components or approaches like these. Um, it is essential, uh, as we've heard yesterday in some of the sessions, uh, the industry requires good manufacturing practice standards uh, and the availability of active pharmaceutical ingredients. Um, so the company that is first able to supply API quality phytocannabinoids and terpenoids derived from cannabis is going to be in the proverbial driver's seat for uh, future commerce in this area. So um, I hope that a few oxes were, oxen were gored in this, but hopefully not fatally. And uh, with that, I'm surprised, but it looks like we may have a few minutes for questions. So thank you. Bonnie. Sure. So TCV, again, is a neutral antagonist. That's a way at low doses. That's a way of saying it takes up space on the receptor, but it'd be different than CBD, which is actually just making it a little harder to bind by changing the conformation. So it's a technical difference. Um, in this instance, I guess you'd say that THCV is taking up space that THC would normally want. Now, you might think from that that it's going to really reduce the clinical efficacy of the THC, but that's not what we see clinically because there are a lot of people using these mixed uh, chemovars that have both, and boy, they're usually very happy with how it makes them feel or uh, treating whatever their condition is. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. That um, what delivery system for THCV has the most e efficacy, whether it's sublingual, edible, you know, that type of thing? Boy, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, there really are not a lot of commercial products um, yet available with THCV. You know, there are always going to be issues of bioavailability. If someone's taking it orally, our advice would be that uh, cannabinoids are better absorbed with food, uh, certainly with concomitant fats. But uh, again, these materials can often have a certain degree of absorption, uh, oromucosally, sublingually. Um, uh, yeah, topically, I don't know about THCV topically, but the, in general, the cannabinoids are great on the skin. They're not absorbed system systemically uh, at this point very effectively at all. Um, so there, we need more work. If you are experimenting in this area, I would really encourage you to 
let people know what you think works? For me, I buy THCV from a vendor. It is an isolate form. She has def diff mostly edibles. We found on a brick and mortar basis, two milligrams of THCV isolate in a dark chocolate is amazing for focus. I have nursing students that take it instead of their Adderall. I'm sorry, 20 milligrams THCV for focus. Two milligrams to five milligrams of isolate for not weight loss, but appetite suppression. And it, it totally works. No, yeah, no, yeah, that's nice. Very good. Next. Hi, Ethan, over here. Thank yeah. you for the talk. That was wonderful. I'm curious to hear what you think the priorities are for human clinical research, both observational and experimental. Well, big topic. That'd be the next hour. Well, you know, I've always said, um, I think the priority areas that haven't had the attention they deserve are obstetrics and gynecology, which has been a forbidden area um, for far too long. On the other area, psychiatry broadly, and you know, I, again, I think that just based on the numbers at the top of the list, anxiety treatment, we can do so much better than the current uh, dangerous and addictive anti-anxiety agents. So those, those are the ones I'd highlight. Thank you. You bet. Nice presentation. Uh, do you think that CBG may be useful to AGAD? To, to treat which? AGAD, um, hyperactivity and AGAD. ADHD, sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think it may be. That wasn't one of the listed ones among the 127 patients that we had, but certainly anxiety is a big component of ADHD for many children and adults with residual ADHD, so I think that there's a good likelihood um, you know, we know that uh, THC in low doses works well. CBD can have a role. So I, I couldn't tell you what the, the ideal combination would be, but I think it's a good bet that CBG would be a, a useful component. Hi there. I was just wondering if you've done any work or your thoughts on the cannabinoid quinones and their therapeutic values for targeted ailments? I'm sorry, I missed a word. The cannabinoid quinones. Quinones. Uh, uh, it's a difficult topic for me. There, I have a history with this. In general, the quinones um, as a chemical group um, have certain toxicities. I, I'd be really hesitant to go there. Um, again, part of this is my bias. I think that the, the cannabinoids as the plant produces them are plenty adequate, and I'm not a fan of semi-synthetics at this point, which invariably are going to be isolates and could not possibly have the broad range of therapeutic effects that a properly constituted uh, cannabis extract would have. So that's my bias. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Russo. It's a great presentation, and I learned a lot. Um, in a general question, how do you recommend as an expert to speak to other physician uh, practitioners and providers on the use of medical cannabis when they're resistant, to want to hear about it, who walk out of the room, you know, obviously those who, how do you get across to them that this is not a recreational drug, that everybody, our patients are just getting high, which is a lot of doctors are, are and practitioners think is happening. Yeah, well, it's difficult. I've been doing this for 27 years, and we've only made incremental improvements. Unfortunately, on the, with politicians, the sad fact is until they or a family member is, has got cancer and needs cannabis, they're rarely going to become convinced. And this is just a story you see repeatedly. Or if you have very sympathetic patients that are able to connect with a politician one-on-one -on -one and bring them on board, so it, it takes tremendous lobbying effort 
So anyway, it sounds like you're involved in that, and I just encourage you to persist. I'm trying to steal the last question over here. I'm very curious about these femtomolar sensitivity scanning tools you have, Ethan. Can they also find uh, or, or explore the tryptamine space we have in the leaves? There was some wonderful paper last year about kynurenic acid in the leaves. Yeah, I mean, the, this technology was borrowed uh, from other areas. So this receptor uh, approach to analysis um, as could be applied uh, to cannabinoids or anything else. On, and maybe it's the future of uh, exploration for trace components in a variety of medicinal plants. I want to have a question about your opinion about COVID-19 and cannabis. Uh, because I have some discussion with Mashulam, and he takes me some idea. And in my practice, I see Morocco yeah, in some I, area. You have no COVID when you have smoking cannabis. This I, is my I have, have no doubt. Um, I think both uh, Bonnie and Dustin can give much better answers on this, but you know, um, you may hear um, of certain cannabis components that will help prevent uh, binding of the virus um, uh, to the receptor. So that's one aspect. And then um, in terms of long COVID, there, there again may be a role, but I, I think we should, uh, I'll confine my answer to that. Um, there are people that, that are in the trenches and, and have much more experience with this. I think there's a role, but I, I could not define it for you at this point. So I think that's our time. Thank you again for your attention.